Welcome, friends, to the afternoon session of the second day of our three-day program here. As I mentioned in the morning, that when we practice something, we get something. If we just hear about it, read about it, talk about it, we get nothing. Reading of any material does not give the experience the material is describing. We can read our scriptures, holy books, holy descriptions, descriptions of other people's experiences over and over again. We don't get the experience. We must practice what we are reading. When we put into practice, then only we get the benefit. Hearing something and feeling good about it is an intellectual satisfaction of intellectual curiosity. It's not spiritual. Spirituality demands that we practice whatever we read, whatever we hear. Otherwise, we're leaving it where it is. It's just an intellectual thing. Intellect has a lot of limitations. The biggest limitation of intellect is that it always leaves us in doubt. If somebody comes to me and says, I have no doubt about a particular thing, and I discuss with him intellectually for 10 minutes, he'll have a doubt. I can create a doubt on any argument by putting a counter-argument and then confuse anybody. Confusion is so normal for our mind because there are things happening around us which is beyond intellect. Intellect has a lot of limitations. So that is why just to have an intellectual satisfaction, it made sense to me. It's great. Intellect likes structures. The mind likes analytical structures, a structure in which you can divide things and look at them in piecemeal. That is why it appeals to us. There are five stages of ascent to our true home. We travel from one to the other. Makes great sense to the mind. One placed above the other. This stack of things appeals to us. Number five appeals to us. Make it eight appeals more. We are so used to this kind of classification, analysis, putting into numbers. And if I were to say there are no stacks of levels of consciousness, the entire consciousness apparatus is just one stack. There's nothing above or below it. Does it make sense? If I were to tell you we have no journey to complete, we are already in our spiritual home from where we came. Makes no sense. If I say that the ultimate truth, the ultimate totality of consciousness is operating in us right now, and the individuated soul is operating at the same time, that the mind is functioning at the same time, the sensory perceptions are functioning at the same time, that a body is functioning at the same time, they are all working in cohesion at one time right now. Doesn't make sense. Who is going to follow this? No, separate them. Analysis is a weakness of the mind. It cannot automatically use synthesis to see the big picture. The big picture can be seen by the soul. When we are spiritual, when we do not employ the mind to understand something, but just look at it, just want to be affected by it, then we get a feeling we see the big picture, we understand it. The mind steps in and we say, now we don't understand it. Such is the situation. Meditation is a way to verify exactly what's happening. And if you meditate enough and go within to all these different levels and find out that we never left our home, the whole thing took place there, the whole show is taking place right which is our destination, that we never left our destination, the journey consists of knowing what our destination is to awaken to it. That we have just to awaken to it. We are there. This can only be discovered through systematic meditation based on a grand picture of what's going on. Not letting the mind through its analysis come in the way and create doubts and keep us out. Meditation is really a simple thing. You can meditate within yourself, 
or you can meditate outside. We all meditate outside. When we put our attention on something outside, we are meditating on that. We like a nice book, we meditate on the book. Wherever you put attention, that's meditation. We meditate on this world all the time. Now, we are required in order to get that grand experience of who we really are, we have to meditate upon ourselves inside, not outside. It's a bit difficult to reverse the flow of attention. Our attention automatically flows from the center of our head, which is the notional center of consciousness. Why do I call it notional? Because that's what we believe. If you ask somebody, if you are merely a point from which all consciousness and all awareness is originating, where do you think the po point is? Obviously, it's not outside your body. But within the body, where is it? Is it in your hands, is your feet, in your legs, in your torso, in your heart? Where are you operating from? You're looking through your eyes. Where are you looking from? If you're thinking about something. Where are you thinking from? Where is it operating from? Where do you feel you are operating from? And you will say, you feel you are operating from inside your head, from behind the eyes. It doesn't take too long to just examine your own self and say, where do I operate from? Where is this consciousness picking up everything from? And the others are all attached to us. We know that we are somewhere inside this head. And the head is around us. And the whole body is around us. And then the whole world is around the body. This is not very difficult to imagine or even visualize or see or experience that the whole world is around this body of yours. There is no world out around except around your body. The whole creation that you know of at any time, whether physical or in the dreams or in the astral stage or any other stage is always around your body, around where you are. All creation is around you. Therefore, if you have to find yourself, it has to be within yourself, whatever your form is. Right now, we are awake, in the wakeful state, in a physical body, at the physical level of consciousness, we feel we are behind the eyes. It doesn't mean we are always there. It doesn't mean we always feel we are there. In fact, if you go to sleep, you are not there. When we go to sleep, and have a dream, we are not there. How do we know we are not there? Because if you were suddenly woken up, which are still in half dream state, and you were asked to touch your eyes, which you can now touch instantly, you will touch your throat and think you are touching your eyes. Even if you are half asleep before going to sleep tonight, when you are feeling sleepy, try to close your eyes and touch your eyes with your hand. When you are awake, you immediately touch them. When you are sleepy, try to touch them. You touch their nose and think they are your eyes. That means even the notional position of who we are, where we are, is shifting in the physical body. It shifts continuously. Depending upon our level of wakefulness, it shifts continuously from one point to another. Since our basic journey towards discovering who we are, start from the wakeful state. Unfortunately, we cannot start it in a dream state. Unfortunately, we cannot even start from an astral state. Unfortunately, we cannot start from the universal mind. There's only one point to start. There's only one point in one form of life, the human life, then we can start. It has to start from behind the eyes in a wakeful state. There are many tips people give us. I am going to share a, a little tip in meditation right now, which I took many years to learn. Even after I was initiated, it took me many years to learn how to start meditation. Because I made a mistake which many others make. That meditation consists of closing your eyes, watching the darkness in front of you, repeating words, and waiting for a sound or light to come. You can wait for a long time. What you are staring at is darkness in front of you. Why is it dark? Because you shut your eyes. If you open your eyes, you will see what is outside. 
when you shut your eyes, you're still looking outside. The mere fact that you put your eyelids in front of your eyes doesn't mean you're gone anywhere inside. You are exactly where you were. And to meditate while you're looking outside has no value. If you close your eyes still looking outside and just wait for something to happen, nothing will happen unless somebody knocks some door outside. Because you are outside. Closing eyes does not take you inside at all. Then there must be some better way of doing it. And that's what took time for me to realize that the better way is to first step inside, then meditate. Not meditate in my body, which is just awake and close its eyes and looking outside. It does not work. It did not work for me. I tried it. Talking from pure experience, it did not work. Some of you might have worked. I don't know. I didn't see anybody working when they're just closing eyes and seeing what's going on. You can relax. Maybe go to sleep. This is easy. Close your eyes, try to meditate, you go to sleep. But you don't find anything else. So the very first step, which is a big tip, I got it from great master. After I complained to him that I am seeing nothing, I close my eyes and I stare in the darkness. And when are you supposed to appear in your radiant form? You said that if I meditate, you'll come there. I've been meditating and waiting for you for years. You never turned up. <laughs> what is all? Are you still hiding somewhere in the darkness? He said, where did you meditate? I said, on the floor. I crossed my legs on the floor. And later on, I tried maybe there's a holy chair or something. So somebody brought a holy chair. I sat on that. It didn't make any difference. Somebody brought a meditation cushion for me, a pillow. I sat on the pillow. I plumped it. Nothing happened. He said, do you know, when you sit on the floor and meditate, you are meditating on the floor. How can you ignore it? Where is your attention? They're sitting on the floor. If you sit in a chair and meditate in a chair, where are you meditating? On the chair. How will you lose the consciousness that you are sitting, not sitting on the chair? The chair will hold your attention no matter how long you sit. So long as you are feeling you're sitting on a chair and trying to meditate, the chair doesn't disappear. If the chair does not disappear, it's holding your attention. If you get a special cushion, you are meditating on the cushion. If it is special, you are meditating more on the cushion. If you say it's my meditation cushion, then the cushion holds more attention. If you have set apart a particular corner of a room in your house and say, this is my meditation corner, then you are meditating on the corner. When you close your eyes and sitting in a special part of your house and say, this is where I meditate, what, is, what do you know? What's your awareness saying? Eyes are closed. You can't see, but you are aware there's a wall of my room. I am sitting outside in that room, my special room. Very good, a special room. So it holds your special attention. It doesn't go away anywhere. Therefore, to make these special arrangements for meditation, they only hold our attention down. And so many of us are doing this mistake. So many of us are making this mistake and not realizing why we are not making progress. So the first step in meditation, effective meditation, is to place yourself behind the eyes inside your head. And don't start any kind of meditation, no repetition, no listening to the sound, no looking for light, no looking for master, till you have done that. To do that, use a faculty given to all of us, imagination. With imagination, we can imagine we are sitting in, the, in that corner where we are sitting actually here. With imagination, we can imagine we are sitting on top of this building. But it's not easy to imagine. When I checked with great master, I said, master, it's very difficult. It's easy to say, imagine you are sitting inside the head. But when I try to sit inside the head, it still looks like this is my body. How does it go and fit into that head? I still feel it's my body here. And I'm supposed to be meditating in the body. And you say, feel that you are there. And he gave an example. He raised his finger like this. He said, take it above your head. 
can you see it? I said, no. Now imagine you are sitting on top of that. Can you sitting, are you sitting there? I imagined, yes. Is there any weight on your finger? No. But you feel you are there? Yes. Bring your finger down. Are you still sitting on it? Yes. Bring it in front. Are you still there? Yes. Jump in now. I jumped in. I was inside the head. And the whole point was use imagination and to make it easier. What we do is first don't start this process. Start believing that this body of yours is a house in which you live. That makes it a little easier. This body is a strange shaped construction of a house. But you live in it. You like to live in the sixth floor of this house because it keeps you awake. We are counting the floors from the energy centers that start from the bottom. The sixth center happens to be behind the eyes, at the eye center. In fact, it's in the two eyes. The two petaled lotus, which is the sixth uh, center from below, is at the two petaled lotus and there is a floor behind it. And if you can say that you have a house with six stories, six levels, six floors, you're on the sixth floor and you can look down upon the se several floors. There are my six floors and there is, there, are eleva there is a staircase moving from one floor to another and there's an elevator behind along the spine. I can feel the elevator. I can go up and down the elevator or I can climb the steps if I have more energy and I am on the sixth floor. Start with that. If you start believing that this is a house and you are living on and you are now sitting on the sixth floor, then, then pick up a chair and put the chair on this floor. The best chair you can choose is going to be free. It won't cost a dime because it's made of your imagination. Imagine the pillow, the special cushion. Put it there, not outside. If you have a special corner in your house, it is a special corner in this room of this house. Just to start with. When you can experience that you are in a house built like a, like a physical body, you're on the sixth floor of that house sitting in the center, then figure out, are you in the center? You have a, a room in which you are in the center. It's a very strange shape because you have a floor behind the eyes and there is your nose jutting outside, which looks funny, but there's a throat below you. There's your top of the head above you, ears on both sides. Are you in the center or are you more in the front? You will find that you are more in the front. Then you have your feet, you're sitting on a chair, press the floor, push the chair back, slide the chair back and center it. When you feel you are right in the center, you can feel that the outside of this house, especially the ears attached to the house on either side, are now exactly where I am in the middle. I am between the two eyes in the center. And that's where I can find the ceiling of my house looks like a sky. When you look up, it's remarkable. And you sit there and pay attention to this wonderful place and start repetition of your Simran. You gather your attention because you started, you got a head start by placing yourself there. Then when we repeat words, the mantra given to us, the rabbit, uh, simran given to us, the words given to us for repetition are not to be repeated like a parrot. They are to be repeated to draw attention to those words, which means every word should be spoken in such a way, deliberately, every syllable can be heard. It's more important to hear the words that you're speaking than to speak them. To speak the words is not so useful as to listen to the words. And the reason is very simple. In our head, in consciousness, there are two faculties operating simultaneously. The faculty to speak in language, in symbols, in pictures, which is being performed by the mind. And the faculty to listen, to see, 
which is being performed by the soul. Both are together, knotted up together. Cannot distinguish which one is which till we go further up. Mind, soul get knotted up so strongly that we do not know who is speaking, who is listening. The truth is the mind always speaks, the soul always listens. When you repeat words, you are using the mind. In the beginning, you use your tongue. Even the tongue starts moving when you start repeating the words. But in due course of experience with some practice, you are able to make the mind alone speak it without involving the tongue or the rest of the vocal cord. But when the mind alone speaks, the speaking of the mind and not listening to what you are speaking will distract you continuously and the mind will drive you away to other thoughts while one channel of the mind is speaking all the time. Have you ever noticed that when you repeat the words, at the same time you are thinking of everything else? If not everything from outside of yourself, at least you are saying, am I speaking sufficiently rightly? Am I speaking loud? Should I be slow? You're making commentary or you're speaking at the same time while you're repeating the words. Who is doing that? Who is the commentator coming on top of the one who is doing Simran? The one who is repeating the mantra? The commentator is also the mind. This mind has a clever ability and tendency to develop several channels to speak. It will allow a local low channel to repeat words and use a finer channel to comment upon it and go outside and think of other things. Oh, when should I stop doing it? You're still, you're still repeating the words and making all the comments on top of it. So many people keep on repeating the words and keep on distracting themselves without realizing what is happening. And they wonder why they are making no progress. Solution for this problem, when you catch yourself, the mind speaking the words and a commentator sitting, don't stop the words. Ask the commentator to join in the words. You will hear your Simran being repeated in two voices. Because the two voices are not the same. The voice that is repeating the words is one voice and commentator has a finer voice. And you can put both and listen to both. Third voice can appear. I remember when His Holiness Dalai Lama came to India, I had the privilege of hosting him in India on his arrival, setting him up in Dharamsala. And we used to go riding in, uh, in a Land Rover I had in those days. And he started speaking little English. So we left our interpreters behind. One of the th subjects we discussed was exactly this. Because his mantra, which he was being taught at that time by two tutors who came with him, who, they were teaching him how to meditate still. He was a very young man. At that time, he realized that he could hear the voices of a distracting mind. Not one level, not two levels, not three, four, by eight levels, he could examine when he was watching, meditating, that they can go so far as to keep on creating another commentator upon commentator. I have not met many people who can hear more than four or five voices. What happens is, if you exhaust the voices and put them to repeat the words, it brings in the mind and brings in images. Your friend will come in front of you, your wife will come, your husband will come, your children will come, somebody's image will come in front of you. You are distracted. You are watching that, remembering something connected with those images and still repeating the words which have no value left because the attention has been taken away. What do we do then? Make that person join in your meditation. What will happen if you practice what I am just telling you? If you practice that, there will be such a chorus of repetition going on in your head. It will not be one mind repeating it. It will be every, every level of the mind, every picture that comes up is all repeating the words. And your attention will be pulled back and not distracted. These are basic tips if you want to make quick progress on the spiritual path and have effective meditation. Once you are able to do that, you will be hearing sounds and light. Sound and light look different. Sometimes you see flashes of light, flashes of different colored lights, colors flowing 
you see them coming from the side, shooting stars, little stars, like a screen with little, little dots coming up. All these little, little experiences start coming up just by putting attention inside. When that happens, don't leave your center. The tendency is to go after them, to look more closely. The more closely you look, the you fall down. You never have more experience. They are coming because you are centering yourself. They are not coming because you are chasing them. They are chasing you because you happen to be at the center of consciousness, closest to where you are supposed to be. Therefore, if images come, colors come, lights come, sounds come, do not leave the center. Don't lean towards them. If a sound comes, you say, is it right-sided, left-sided? We were told, go on the right side. You lean toward the right side. You lost. Nothing else happens after that. You lean to the left side. You have been indoctrinated. Well, right side is Dayal, left side is Kaal. And therefore, you're trying to put your attention this side. Do you know what happens? If you do that, you are leaving the center and moving sideways. How will you make progress when you leave the center? Why is an instruction given like this that says, listen to the right side? It's only in the beginning. The real sound that we call the Shabd, we call the sound current that pulls us, does not come from the right or the left. It has no association with sights. It comes from within yourself. It comes from within. And since you are ascending, it looks like it's coming from the sky above you, through you. It does not come from any side. So long as you are continuously trying to determine the side, you are putting your attention on the ears and not on your own self. Another mistake. So many of us make that mistake. The real sound will come from there. The sounds that we hear which have no pull are created by many forces in our body. So many of these sounds are physical. Even the blood through moving through its veins and arteries creates a sound if you put attention. Even heartbeat can be heard. Breathing can be heard. There are so many sounds that come, they are physical. There are some sounds that are not physical, but they are also practice sounds. They don't pull you anymore. They don't sweep you off your floor and take you up. These sounds at best serve you to use your attention to listen to a sound. That's it. But that's good. That's good to practice with any sound that you can hear. Of course, if you can hear sound from both sides, hear it from the right. And the intuitive side, it just happened to be the brain like that, that the intuitive and the reason sides in the brain are separately located. So that is why just listening is more helpful to begin with. It's only practice sound. It doesn't mean that that sound is going to take you anywhere. It's still just for practice that you can hear and you can sit in the center. Do not move from the center to go toward the sound to listen to it. The sound must come and pull you from the center and from the top. It looks like it's a flow of a sound. There are so many real sounds also they resemble little bells, <clears throat> sounds of crickets, bells, and those sounds have like a layer of sounds. It appears that we can hear a sound which is close to us, and then there's one just behind that. There's one still further behind, one looking from a distance. You see the sounds have a certain area in which they are coming from some distance, some are close to us. The sound that will really help you pull your attention without effort is the sound of the big bell. And you do not hear it straight away. You will first hear its echo. The echo of the sound is behind these sounds that you normally hear. Now that's a little practice how to leave your attention from one sound to another. You listen to one sound. You can see this one in the background. 
to jump from that to the background sound and then to the other one brings you to the bell sound. If people didn't tell me this, if master didn't tell me this, I was going on listening to practice sound saying I'm hearing the Shabbat all the time. What kind of Shabbat was that I had no pull in it? That I was going on listening automatically? Some people were not sure if my ear, eardrums had some problem that I was having this sound. But the sound that pulls has a power that it sweeps you off. It has a pull because it's indeed the sound of consciousness. I have a very important point. What does the sound represent? What is the sound? Why there is a sound? The sound is a manifestation of consciousness, the self, and not of the experience of the self. All other experiences are not of the self, but experiences which the self is having as an experience. The sound manifests to show you have the experiencer also. The sound that pulls you is the manifestation, an audible manifestation of who you are, of your own consciousness. And that is why when that sound is heard and pulls you, you are pulling yourself to yourself which is the very purpose of meditation. Listening to that sound makes you forget where your hands and feet are, makes you forget where your body is faster than any other method that I know of. The sound also emanates light. We are not used to accepting that sound and light are the same thing because our sense perceptions don't recognize like that. One is a function of the eyes, one is a function of the ears. We have divided them. We cannot assume or even imagine that sound and light are the same thing. But you can experience it. You can experience that the radiance that comes from the sound is the radius that comes from the light. And therefore, later on, they become one completely. And you can't call it sound, you can't call it light. What do you call it? some kind of a radiance, some kind of a resonance. It's a lighted resonance, luminous resonance, which is again a representation of our own consciousness. Why is this sound so important and why should we listen to it is because it is connected at all times with all levels of consciousness. Nothing else is. When you move from one level of awareness to another, like you wake up from a dream, the dream ends. There's a big break between the dream level of experience and the wakeful level of experience. When you wake to the next level, the experience is totally broken, separate. There's no connection between the two, except some connected memories and some people who appear in both states of consciousness. But the sound is a continuous state from the physical human state and continuously connects you to a totality of consciousness without break. If you were to realize it, this is the power of the sound that I am listening and latch on to it. And latch on to nothing else. There is no way anything can stop you from going to the top. The experience will keep on changing around the sound. Sound will change in its audible state, in its the way it sounds. It will change. Ultimately, it won't look like sound. It's still sound. You will know it's the same thing. But ultimately, it will take you to new experiences continuously. Therefore, the royal road to your true home is the sound current that emanates from your true home and continues to be here because it is carrying consciousness with it. It carries consciousness. It carries the soul, the, the real nature of the soul with it. And therefore, that sound, it has been described in so many ways. We don't know if we should call it sound. What should we call it? It's a creative power that starts from totality, creates every level of consciousness, every level of experience. What should we call it? They have tried to call it by different words. I know in, in the Bible, in John's Gospel, they call it the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. What word do you want to hear? Word. W capital. 
was in the beginning. Before we talk of God, we talk of word. And word was God. That means ultimate creator. When I looked at the American Columbia Dictionary to see, do they describe the word in the dictionary? So I opened up and saw the word with W capital. Word means the Bible. It means a book. Doesn't it occur to anybody that here the very book that you are talking about is defining the word as the creator of everything and then you still say it's a book. It's not only that. Go to the Indian scriptures, the Rig Veda. Out of four Vedas, the most ancient Sanskrit books on way of life, including spiritual life, the Rig Veda deals with that. The opening line there is, in the beginning there was a nod, and the nod was the creator, and all things were made by that, which nothing was made outside of it. Almost a Sanskrit translation of John's Gospel. Since it came first, I believe John's Gospel is a tra Hebrew translation of the Sanskrit. Say the same thing. Other religious doctrines also talk of the creative power of sound. Why do we call it sound or word? Why not call it power? Why not call it creative power? Why not use something else? The reason why we call it word, sound, shab, nod is because in the physical level it can be heard. Right now we can hear it. Appropriate to call it something that can be heard. A word can be heard, a spoken word can be heard, a spoken music can be heard, a sound can be heard, bells can be heard, all this can be heard. Since at this level it is audible, we call it the word or shabd or nad. Any name you can give it. So the real secret is to allow yourself to stay in the center with all the imaginary devices that we can use and allow the sound to pull you. Simplest way, Camino Real, Royal Road, to go to your home, back home. Needs little practice, everything needs practice, you know. There was a king once, he was a very sharp shooter and with bow and arrow. They, that was the best instrument they had, bow and arrow. He could shoot so well, not only directly on a target. If the target was lying flat somewhere, he could shoot the arrow up and bring it down on the target. Great expert. One day, this king was coming back from a hunt or somewhere and he saw his wife, the queen, standing on the balcony of the palace, which was a little height. He said, I am going to give a big surprise to my queen today. So, he found that she was wearing that big jewelry on her forehead, which was customary for queens to wear heavy jewelry hanging just on their forehead. So, he shot his arrow. An arrow was so accurately shot, it went up and took the ornament out and dropped it down. He walked up to the balcony and said, My dear, you are not wearing your head jewelry today. She said, Oh, it might have fallen somewhere. He said, look there, my arrow is right in your... See, he, he thought the wife will exclaim, you are great. She said, that's not a big deal. By practice, one can do anything. He was so upset, as kings used to get upset in those days. He said, you don't appreciate what I've done. You don't deserve to be my queen. He'll banish you to the forest. He called the guards, take her away and throw her into the forest for lions and others to eat her up. Queen was banished. When she went into the forest, all the animals looked at who has come now. And there was a big elephant, she elephant, was giving birth to a baby elephant. And as the little baby elephant was born, this girl loved that little baby elephant, took the baby elephant to the stream and gave a bath to the baby elephant and played with her like this, the baby elephant, and put it down on the feet of the mother elephant. Mother elephant looked very pleased, wagged her ears, wagged her tail, and felt happy. Every day, this girl would now bathe the baby elephant, and the baby elephant becoming bigger and bigger, she didn't realize. Every day, her muscles grew along with the baby. One day, when the baby was like an elephant, and she was playing with him, some visitors who were shooting a movie or something 
for a play. They came to the forest and they saw a woman carrying an elephant. They couldn't believe it. They said, how can you do this? She said, no, I have been doing this. This is my baby. The baby elephant I have been bringing up like this. So it's not a big deal. They said, come on, it's a big deal. Come and op operate in our entertainment company. You'll make a lot of money. We'll buy you new clothes. We'll take care of you. They took her into the city. And she became an entertainer who could carry an elephant, big elephant in her hands. Everybody was surprised. The king heard about a woman who can carry an elephant. He said, let's have a show in my palace. So he held the show in the palace. And the lady came and lifted the elephant. The king said, give her all the money that she wants. He took the money and said, take this money. You have performed so well. She says, king, with practice, one can do anything. He said, this must be my wife. <laughs> and took her back as a queen. The story merely means that with practice, you can achieve anything. And all we need in meditation is practice, more practice, more practice. Don't give up. If you say, I'll practice on week weekends and do five hours of meditation on weekends, it's not as good as doing half an hour every day. You build a momentum in these things. And the final tip I'd like to give is do not lose the momentum. Keep it up and try to move one inch forward. On the other hand, I say don't expect results too fast. Get slow and steady. Rapid results into something totally uh, unusual for us because we are so used to watching this reality. It can knock us off. It can even knock us off from meditation. It can even make us lose our faith. So therefore, take it easy and understand the little progress that you make on a daily basis. But keep on making some progress on a daily basis. We used to practice meditation early morning. The theory was that early morning is very quiet. Everybody who is not interested in meditation is sleeping at 3 o'clock in the morning. The sun hasn't come out yet. The dawn hasn't come. It's dark. There are no telephone calls coming. There's nothing happening at that time. Therefore, 3 to 5.30 to spend that couple of hours, or hour, two hours and a half, a good time to meditation. But that was convenient at that time. It does not mean that there's any rigidity or there's any special requirement it should be that time. Whichever time suits us, people work at night. They can't do that. Some people, by rhythm, is not suited for working early morning. Their biorhythm is active in the evenings. They can do in the evenings. Some people feel more alert in the morning. They can do in the morning. Don't make it a religion. Don't make meditation or spirituality into a religion. It's a practical way of discovering who you are, no matter what your religion. You can have any religion and you can still practice spiritual meditation. Great Master, when we were in the Dera, in the ashram there, Great Master used to come out for a walk in the morning at 3 o'clock with his cane. And if he was, it was hot weather, so the hot weather we would sleep outside on our little cots. Their beds were like little, little cots, which could be easily moved in and out. So we would be sleeping and he would use his cane to wake us up. Time for meditation. We would suddenly get up and say, oh Master, yes, yes. And we, we would look at if the Master is gone or not. So master would go take a turn and we'd go to sleep again. He'd come back. He said, I haven't gone anywhere. <laughs> That's how he made us practice meditation. I know the mind's tendency is to procrastinate. The mind tendency is to put off. The mind tendency is, we can do it tomorrow. Let's start tomorrow. Let's start when we get vacation. We don't get the benefit like that. Therefore, constant practice, even little practice, Supposing you can't find all the time, find little time. Somebody asked me the other day, is it essential to do two and a half hours of meditation? I said, no. He said, I never got initiated because of this condition. I was surprised that a condition like this makes a religion. When you impose so many conditions on a scientific experiment, it looks like a religion to me. Or rituals and rites. I said, no. Start with one minute of meditation and make it two minutes next day. 
and three minutes the next day. If you can add a minute a day, you'll have very good meditation. And you won't even feel it like that woman was lifting the elephant. She was lifting the elephant, the elephant was growing in weight. She didn't feel it because every day she did it. Supposing she had a gap of a week, she wouldn't be able to lift the elephant. Same thing with us. If we do something regularly, adding a minute to it, it's effective meditation. And quality is more important than quantity. How much you are able to stay in the center with the tips I've been giving you is more important than how much time you spend on it. And then you will notice, as I have noticed, you will notice some days you feel good about meditation. It's good meditation, your mind was so alert and you were able to hold on. And some, mind, some days are so confused that you can't meditate at all. Your mind is just running around. This is natural. It is natural because it's biorhythmic. Our biorhythms move up and down and the biorhythms are also affecting our meditation. Our clarity for doing things, they affect them. So don't worry about them. If they come good days and bad days, it's just a sign curve. Everything is happening according to sign curve. The whole life is a sign curve. The whole life is ups and downs. It also applies to meditation. Don't give up because of that. That now I'm not feeling, maybe I'm going wrong. What happens is, in regular meditation, supposing this is a yardstick of your meditation in front of me, a line I'm drawing here. And it goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down, which is normal. With practice, what will happen will be, ups and downs will not go away. But this whole bar will be raised like this. So every time the up is higher than the previous up, the down is less than the lower down. That you will start experiencing. That's normal. So you make progress. And have patience. Don't be impatient. We have waited for such a long time for this opportunity to say, I have made no progress in two months or three months. This is not that kind of thing. This, this is a lifetime of opportunity. Lifetime of getting something so real. So impatience does not fit in with this kind of meditation. So patiently do it every day. See new progress is added to it every day, little by little. And you will eventually have complete success. And you will feel so happy and contented. You will see the world very differently. You will see what exactly how it's constructed. You will see how this system of projecting outside, what is inside, where the projector is that creates all images around us. You will see how karma works. You will see how people who come in one life, another lifetime, what the, there's no connection between them. It's all your own mind creating everything. You will see how karma works internally and not externally. That we see the same people again. They are not the same people. Every person who is there is having its own universe. You will see all that. Oh, your whole outlook changes on everything. And you feel you are on top of the world. A certain kind of contentment and happiness comes in you. A blissful state comes in you, which ultimately never allows you to bother about anything. You remain on top of the world. You remain in a constant state of bliss. Not that once in a while you get it. Your whole life changes to something where you can enjoy every moment of life. You can watch every situation very differently and laugh at it also. It's a worthwhile goal. I hope some of you will try this. I tried. I'm very happy. I succeeded. I hope you will too. My master told me, great master told me, when he initiated me, I am giving you that which I got from my master. I am sharing that information, that knowledge which I got from my master. It has worked for me. I hope it will work for you. If you find something better than that, go and take it. He didn't stop me. He didn't make his teaching a cult. Now you're trapped by me. You can't go anywhere. He said, explore. Go look forward and find anything better. And if you find something better, take it. Don't come back to me to get my permission. Permission granted in advance. I took him very seriously. I went out of my way to find out if there was something better. I was not waiting for something to come. 
said, I have to go out. He challenged me. It's almost like a challenge. Go and find something better. I have to find something better. But then he also said, if you find something better, come and tell me, so I'll also take it. These are great master's words. If you find something better than what I am sharing with you, take it, do me a favor, come back and tell me, I'll also go and take it. I have spent my life looking for something better. Not only have I not found something better, I have not even found a description of something better. I have not even found somebody talking about something is better. So, I spent a lot of time, several decades now, in trying to find something better, and I couldn't find anything better. If somebody else came and told me tomorrow, there's something better, I'll take it. Under instructions from my own master. But I found, as we experience more and more, this challenge disappears. Because you find the root of all perfection from where the imperfectness is being created. You go to the very root of creation. When you find the root of creation with clarity and with no question, doubt about it, with a certainty that comes with that experience, you can't know that there can be anything better. Because truthfully, you discover your, within your own self, there is nothing better, could be nothing better. If you, if you could redesign the whole universe, if the whole universe was reconstructed, maybe something better could come up. But not in the construction of the universe as it exists today. Not in the creation that exists today. Go and verify it. I am saying nothing to you that is not verifiable. I am saying nothing to you that you cannot yourself check out. I have nothing special that you don't have. We all have the same apparatus in consciousness. We have the same apparatus for experiencing things. We have the same apparatus to go back home to our origin and to our true home. All of us have the same. Therefore, you cannot say that person is special, he got it. That tribe is special, they got it. That nation is special. That group is special. Nothing of the sort. All human beings are equally endowed for this. And this is a practice. It does not depend upon your color of the skin. It does not depend on your religious background does not depend upon your nationality, does not depend upon your gender, does not depend upon your age. It's open to all. So such an open thing is such a, a great opportunity. Try it. If it works, good. If it doesn't work, try something else. It's as open as that. I hope these little tips on meditation will help you. Let's try a little meditation ourselves. Let's try to do what I was just talking about. Let's see if we can really achieve. In this first position is that if you have to think your body is a house, you can't move it after that. It will crack if you move a house. You don't move a house. So you sit upright. Upright position is good because these floors are placed upright. The energy centers are operating upright. They are not operating the same efficiently if you lie down. Therefore, Meditation lying down is not as effective as meditation upright. Therefore, sit upright in your chairs, on the ground, wherever you are. Keep your body upright. Close your eyes and imagine this is your house. You are on the sixth floor of that house, behind the eyes. Take a chair or a cushion or a pillow, whatever your preference. Place it on the floor behind the eyes. Thump your feet on the floor to see it is hard enough not to slip down. See that the floor is strong and is not soft that takes you down. On that hard floor behind the eyes, sit down in the center. Push yourself back till you are sure you are in the middle of the head. Be conscious that the eyes are in front of you, the back of the eyes are in front of you, the ears are on either side of you. You are sitting in the center. Do nothing except sit in the center. Any images coming in front of you, ignore them. Do not move towards them. Any sounds you hear, ignore them. Do not move towards them. 
do not think of anything else except what is happening around you in the head. Look around without moving from the center. Look around right, left, above, below, but do not move from the center. Stay in the center. Don't think of anything else. Only where you are and what's going on there. Look at the walls of this room in which you are placed. Look at the ceiling. Look at the room expanding in size. Look how it's malleable, flexible. Don't move from the center. Those who have a Simran or a repetition of words available, start repeating slowly. Others just wait in the center. Very slowly listening to every syllable of the words. Strictly remain in the center. No moving forward. Don't follow any sound. Don't follow any light. Don't follow anything. Watch from a distance. Listen from a distance, from the center. Hear your own words of repetition from the center. No other thoughts. Don't think of anything else right now. Only what's happening around you in the center of the head. Any pictures come in front of you, watch from a distance. Don't move toward them. Any sounds you hear, hear them from the center. Don't move toward them. No leaning. Only upright to the center. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Rub them, that's the real. Welcome back. How many of you could do it very easily? How many of you had a difficulty staying there? More practice, more practice. It will happen with practice. But that's the way to start. There's a starting point. If you don't start from where I just took you, it may not work for a long time. Meditation is, starts from there. You have to be there. We'll do some more exercise tomorrow.